1996, author David Foster Wallace released his magnum opus, Infinite Jest, an 1,100-page post-postmodern takedown of the great American novel. It was a smash success all throughout the world. Unfortunately, it just wasn't very good. Famously dense and nigh unfinishable, the book earned a backlash as great as its praise. Join me, Jesse Graham, as we untangle this tale of boredom, addiction, and French-Canadian separatists in our quest of understanding on the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast. This is the jest that never ends. Oh yes, this jest is infinite. And David Foster Wallace wrote it thinking it was good. And dorks, they all went swallowed it because they think they should. It is the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast. How are you, listener out there? I'm glad you're here to join me. My name is Jesse Dram, comedian and... Uh, Overall cantankerous grump, wannabe academic, failure, failure. Well, not an academic, I'm a college dropout. Uh, what's the fucking word? Intellectual. I didn't have to go ask my girlfriend because I totally forgot that word. Yeah. Welcome to episode three. This is with Katu King, a comedian out of Brooklyn, originally from the Philadelphia scene. That is where I met her. Uh, so we've had two episodes in a row with people who love the book, and Katsu is reading the book for the first time right now, and she is not a fan. Gotta be honest with you, I've been playing it very light. The guests I've had on, you know, they have been, you know, endearing, and I want to be respectful of them, even though we completely disagree on this book, and I cannot state how fun it was to have somebody else on who just really really didn't like it if you're a fan of the book i i you're gonna have to listen to this episode go look at yourself in the mirror after and ask yourself do i really like this book who am i was this lump always there i don't know um so yeah this is episode three we'll be discussing pages i believe it is 61 to 95 roughly i i don't recall right now i really love this episode um quick uh shop notes i want to give a shout out to the subreddits of infinite jest and david foster wallace i know quite a few are listening because this was the first place i promoted the podcast and y'all downloaded en masse i really thank you for that again i'm gonna try to make this interesting for you guys who know it inside and out few of you made the points that uh in the prologue i seemed like a little bit of a vindictive asshole went back and listened and yeah you got a point you got a point so i went and i went and re-recorded that not to not to hide any failures on my part believe me my failures will be very apparent throughout every single one of these episodes like the fact that i paused it to go ask my girlfriend uh how, what's the word intellectual oh intellectual okay bye but you know i i i want to be nice and the fact that you guys point out like you know he seems like a real dick somebody said i'm insufferable and yeah that does make me feel bad which you know not on eh, fuck them for saying that no for me personally i need to be better so i rewrote it i tried to you know let you guys know that yes i am ragging on this book a lot but a lot of my criticisms will be in very hyperbolic for the humor's sake of it Apparently, I might have made a suicide joke by David Foster Wallace. There's nothing funny about the fact that he killed himself. If anything, that just comes from my background as a comedian. My my comedy, personally, by the way, Jesse Dram, just D-R-A-H-A-M. Look me up. I got funny stuff out there. I'm a funny guy. A lot of stand-up. I do tend to lean dark. So, I'm going to make you guys a promise right now. I'm going to try to not make any suicide jokes that I feel are too serious and if one does come out just know it doesn't come from any kind of place of malice i mean one of one of my favorite comedy bits i have is about my fucking dad dying and telling me that he probably killed somebody when i was 12 so you know it's not like i'm just picking on the guy here i don't think it's funny suicide is horrible no matter who it is and obviously if i wish suicide on somebody because they wrote a book i didn't like that would make me a real fucking scumbag um, other thing, just cleaning up. So, 
I have a confession, again, about Mr. Uh, David Foster Wallace. Motherfucker got me on something. I listened to This Is Water the other day, which is a commencement speech he gave at a college I didn't bother to look up, but I... A commencement speech at a college that I didn't bother to look up, and I really, really liked it. Um, I thought it was very good, where he uh, waxes philosophic on the idea of a liberal arts college that like, oh, well, here we teach you how to think and what that really means to him, which is learning to think. And for him, uh, he really made the point that it wasn't something condescending, learning to think. It was learning to take in everything. Like, I have a few quotes here that I loved. Uh, the most dangerous thing about an academic education is that it enables my tendency to over-intellectualize stuff to get lost in abstract thinking instead of simply paying attention to what's going on in front of me. He talks about uh, the inherent selfishness of just existing. Again, quote, Everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe, the realest, most vivid and important person in existence. Now, this he's not talking about himself in particular, but how everybody naturally has to see things through a selfish spectrum just because the self is the thing that decides we're like we're the only we're the only one that can feel our pain so it is very easy to get stuck in your own head and discount the other feelings of people around us because as much as we can empathize with their pain we cannot feel it as they do or experience life the way they do come to the same conclusions as they do based on that life but we are in a position to judge them based on the limited information we have there's a lot more quotes here. I would suggest you look up This Is Water. The reading I found online is about 20 minutes, but it's well worth it. It's a video. You don't have to look at it, but it's just a picture of him in a lovely white bandana. Oh, yeah. That's a that's a baby face turn right there for a wrestler. That's how you know he's going good. That's why I liked it, I guess. That's what signaled it. The, I saw a white bandana. I thought, I kind of like this guy now. So here's a long quote. This will be the last one. Because here's something else that's weird but true. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshipping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the, cho and the ch compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of god or spiritual type thing to worship be what JC or Allah or Yahweh or the Wiccan Mother Goddess or the Four Noble Truths or some inviolable set of ethical principles is that pretty much Anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. On one level, we all know this stuff already. It's been codified as myths, Proverbs, cliches, epigrams, parables, the skeleton of every great story. The whole trick is keeping the truth up front in daily consciousness. Worship power and you will end up feeling weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious things about these forms of worship is not that they're evil or sinful. It's that they're unconscious. These are the default settings. They're the kind of worship you just gradually slip into day after day, getting more and more selective about what you see and how you measure value without ever being fully aware that that's what you're doing. That is great goddamn writing. And it's, aside from Mary Austin broke my heart, this is the first thing to really grab me from David Foster Wallace. 
to rag on him a little bit, there are numerous parts in this speech where he goes, et cetera, et cetera, blah, 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 and skips over things he wrote going to show, oh, this man did not have any capability of editing. If he had had the uh, the task of reading Infinite Jest out loud, we might have had a very good 300-page book with a lot of yada, 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 okay, and then there's an air conditioner in the car, but that's not fucking important. Let's get the tiny Yule over here. Oh, if only he could have done it so, but, you know, people, I don't know. People love a challenge, even if the reward is not all that great. Maybe that has something to do with the book. Maybe I'm lazy and just think challenges are inherently dumb. Who knows? You know who probably does know? Our guest today, Katu King. Uh, be sure to check out her podcast, Lil Saint Island. It's not exactly that, but if you type in those names, I think Saint is S-T, period, with her and uh, Kevin Hufe, you will, yeah, it's going to be an interesting podcast. Very, Both very funny people I met in Philly. They have left for the grander shores of New York, or so it seemed at the time before it became Coronavirus Island. Uh, I'm assuming Manhattan. I'm surely wrong. If you are listening to this, be sure to like, review, subscribe. Uh, I know we're early on, but so far I've shown is if you call me a dickhead, I'll probably do something to change it. I'm just a good guy like that. So here we are. Episode 3, pages 60-something to, I believe, 95. We are recording. Oh, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome uh, to the I Hate Infinite Jest podcast, episode three, Katu King. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. It's a nice day out. It is a nice day out. It's a nice day to spend a half hour finicking with the uh, audio equipment, trying to figure out what the goddamn oh, problem is. It was half an hour, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? All my fault. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's not your fault. I feel like a good part of it is Zoom's fault. Yeah, this is, yeah, fuck Zoom. This, this episode is brought to you by Skype. Fuck Zoom. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I met Katu doing comedy in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. You're now based in, I know, New York, anywhere more specific than that? Uh, Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah. Down in Brooklyn. And, uh, yeah, I, uh, she is a big part of the reason this podcast exists now i, I know I, I i'm reading Go ahead. sorry i'm reading it just for the first time in quarantine and i've been posting about it mm -hmm. uh yeah what are, what are your thoughts of uh the the overall product because you're the first person we've had on who is not like a mega fan of this book you're as new to this as well i i tried to read it before <laughs> and uh then my better sense got a hold of me and I gave it up after 400 pages. Right. So I'll tell you what my process has been like. Okay. I'll read 50 pages of Infinite Jest and then I'll think to myself, why the fuck am I doing this? Nobody is making me do this. And then I'll read a complete non-Infinite Jest book. <laughs> <laughs> Since this has started, I just finished uh, Crime and Punishment before this, which is more, you know, I, I like the mm -hmm. older stuff. And literally, as I'm reading this, I want to start reading Brothers Karamazov, and it's sitting on my bookshelf like, like a sexy lady hitchhiking while I'm stuck with my terrible wife, Infinite Jess, that I just need to get through a few more weeks with. Yeah, I know. Cause, because I'm not hosting this podcast, I do like, like I'm only, I think 200 pages in. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not that far past where the section we're going to talk about today. Uh -huh. But, and the reason for that is because I keep stopping and reading other books. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that's made it uh, tolerable for me is I'm actually, I'm only like 20 pages past the section you and I are going to read today because just, Reading it very, very slowly is, it, it's making me marinate on it some more. I don't think I like it anymore, but I'm trying, I'm attempting to absorb it. Yeah. What do you, so have you been reading all the footnotes? I have been reading the footnotes. They don't, they, they don't add very much. I don't think. Yeah. There's, okay. There's some of it. I have such strong feelings about the footnotes. I hate them. 
That's my strong feeling. I hate them so much. <laughs> well, well, what about, I mean, it's like he's trying to break up the narrative, which is a good thing to By do. By what? Explaining story. technical names for drugs? Exactly. You know, I, I had this, somebody commented on a post about it this week, like a, an older woman, like a mm -hmm. late middle aged, And she just said, like, I've tried so many times and I don't get it. And we came to the conclusion, like, can a novel be a great novel if it's so unenjoyable to read? Like, I don't, yeah. I don't understand everyone's litmus on this. I know, uh, it's, oh man, people give like, a lot of the high school required reading books shit because they're unenjoyable. But this is worse. Yeah, it's, and it, the whole reason, oh, uh, what I was going to get to is I'd had this idea for the podcast for a while, but I just kind of sat on it like I do with all my great ideas that other people then, you know, come up with on their own and get great success out of them. And then it was a post you made on your Facebook that, uh, do you remember which one it was? I remember you had something saying Teen Cosmo is better literature than Infinite Jest. But I think this yeah. one preceded that. Oh, you just said you were going to read it in quarantine. Yeah, I said I was going to read it in quarantine. And I did. <laughs> there you go. And everybody else chimed in. And then I start, you know, had to stick my big nose in. And then I decided, well, what the fuck else am I doing in quarantine? I'm going to read it too. And I'm going to take up this 30-week enterprise for a book I don't even like. That's a good way to keep my sanity. In these times. It is. Well, it's like a, it's a productive project. Oh yeah. If nothing else, uh, you know, it keeps me going. So what is your specific, when do you first hear about the book? Okay. So let me paint the picture. Um, I'm 18 years old. I'm going to design school because I am fucking stupid. Sounds and like an 18 year old decision. Continue. It's a very 18 year old decision. I'm going to design school. First day of design school, I meet somebody, you know, six foot one blue mohawk and i'm like hell yeah and that guy's favorite book is infinite chess this seems and to that be, is what i hear about it for the first time this seems to be the way many women first learn about infinite jest also he apparently loved it enough that he dyed his hair the same color as the paperback so i applaud yeah. him for that no longer that color i think i don't fucking know i don't know <laughs> Maybe there was a new pressing and he's trying to match that one. So <laughs> maybe, um, so, uh, but yeah, so I have the classic story of dating an infinite jest guy in college. But so did he try to get you to read it right away? Uh, well, no, no. And I don't think I would have. <laughs> Okay, well, because th that's the, there's the two different flavors of them. Is It's one thing if Infinite Jest is just their favorite book, mm -hmm. but a lot of them seem to be David Foster Wallace evangelists. Yeah. It's like... um, he was kind of in the middle. Okay. And one thing that they did was we had an argument because they wanted to dress up as one of the characters for Halloween, and I was like, nobody's going to fucking know who you are. Which character? Um, I want to say Hal, but I could be wrong. So did he just carry a tennis racket and do brown face? I don't, uh, unless they were brown, I don't know. But <laughs> I don't know. No, this is a white person, fucking obviously. I would like to find a minority Infinite Jest fan. Uh, that would be great. That would be very interesting. So one of the things that turns people off to this book a lot is uh, the fan base. And... I find it interesting that I don't think a lot of the fan base really has ironic considering how self-awareness is such a theme of the book. Mm. And I don't think a lot of them have the self-awareness to realize how they come off with how much they really preach about this book and try to, I mean, it's a, it's a stereotype of women, you know, who have been hammered of you need to read this book. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what has your been, what, what's been your, uh, experience as a woman encountering that fan base oh very negative that's honestly i think that i keep reading this book and there are snippets of the book where like i'll read a little bit i'll read like a paragraph or a chapter where i'm like oh that's actually kind of good mm -hmm. maybe i would like this if i wasn't so predisposed to not liking this <laughs> like i there's other doorstopper books that i like mm -hmm. there's other good huge books um, in general, I'm a literary gal. 
Mm. But I'm so predisposed to not liking this just based on the people who are fans of it that I think it's affecting how I read it. Especially, Uh, especially the parts where they talk about women because this book does not really like women. It does not care for them. Uh, Honestly, I don't think it's till we got to this section of the book that we actually had a female character speaking and expressing themselves other than that they've just been kind of that's true they've been referred to as like billboards passing on the highway yeah it's just like a lot of the book is just like hal and Orin like thinking mean things about the women they slept with exactly and it's it's actually a shame because we'll get to it when we get into it but uh that that chapter that deals with what's her name kate bompton who uh katherine gomper who yeah is one of the first major women to have any lines in this. I actually really like that fucking chapter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's all the thing. Okay. I'm going to compare this to something really stupid. Have you seen The Witcher TV show on Netflix? Wait, what's the I have not seen The Witcher yet. No. Okay. Uh this is a very like pulpy uh like fantasy TV show. Um but Part of the reason why it's not that good is because, like, they kill off or, like, stop showing characters way too quickly. So you can't really care about anyone. And that's also how I feel about this book. All right. Well, that, that's a problem with, like, with film with ensemble casts in general, where it's, mm-hmm. like, sometimes you see a lot of directors who, like, they have no restraint and they need to give everybody their own little backstory yeah. for something that's not going to come up. I talked on last week's episode with Steve Clark. Uh, did, did you read the part? It would have been the chunk before this where he just does blackface for three pages. Oh, my God. I had um, I had a great conversation about this with future guest Dalton Pruitt. Okay. It was horrible. That's <laughs> I hated it so much. And first of all, there's no reason for it. No. And like these characters never show up again. And it doesn't affect anything in the book. Well, I've been told that uh, Wardeen is the person they refer to through that entire section. And apparently she's going to show up later in a drug treatment facility. That's what somebody told me that. I don't know. I'm not there yet. But it is really, especially considering it's such a different style of writing i Mm. find a lot of his writing very mechanical which is something i see is a huge turnoff for me it's like you know like i have a guitar here behind me we're gonna stop the podcast so i can explain Uh, in intricate detail that anybody but a guitar designer wouldn't even find interesting and that's and that's a replacement for character i don't know yeah i hate that so much it's it's so annoying again Back to the footnotes. I fucking hate the footnotes. Right. I hate the footnotes. I don't care about tennis. <laughs> I don't. No. I would rather read the parts in Moby Dick where they talk about knots or how mysterious whales are. That's actually kind of good. There's a higher likelihood of you encountering a whale or needing a specific knot than needing to know the ventilation system for the fucking Enfield Tennis Academy. Yeah, which isn't fucking real. It's God. stupid. I, Can- I hate minute world building like that. I do not fucking care. No, I do not care. Can I just say how much more fun it is having somebody on the podcast who also hates the book? This, been, yeah, this is great. Talking shit, so much fun. Ooh, I've had to be so respectful. And it's there are parts of it. It's, it's growing on me. But even at the end of it, I think when I'm done this book, I'm going to look at it as like a triathlon. And like, okay, I did it. I just really kind of hurt and I never want to do it again. Yeah. A supposedly is- fun book I'll never read again, just to throw that reference out there. Right. I'm never going to read this again. Oh no. my God. It, it feels too much like a chore. You uh, and, know? <laughs> and the annoyance is a lot of the super fans. So people try to talk you into this book. Again, it is very evangelical. Mm-hmm. I've had somebody say like, oh, well, it's, uh, it's really good if you have a dictionary nearby so that you can reference the words you don't know, to which I say, yeah, what part of that sounds like fucking fun book reading to you? Exactly. And then they it's take fun. it an extra level where a lot of people say, well, oh, the second time through, you get so much more out of it. Like, I don't, exactly. The look on your face. The look on your face, as I just said, it's malignant. That's the response you should have. It's, that's, that's so annoying. That's how <laughs> I kind of feel about certain things like films or tv shows but even books but when other people say it it's wrong exactly yeah yeah (laughs) 
that's it. When other people say it, it's wrong. Um, also, that so one thing that does bother me about the writing style, and this is probably like honestly my biggest complaint. Uh, it's like show offy. It's yes. yes, it's it's just David Foster Wallace showing how big his word dick is, and I hate it. Now, all right, let me ask: Have you seen uh, the movie about him? End of the tour. No. So this is one of the things that it actually, it, it kind of poisoned me on this is I had my image of this man based on his writing. And again, this could be like apologism somewhere, but the movie and a lot of his, like uh, I listened to him reading an essay called This is Water that I actually really, really liked. I want to imagine him looking down his nose and under his bandana at the world at large. But Every th other thing paints him as like this really sincere, constantly guessing himself kind of guy. And I, I don't see the connection. I don't think he can be either of those things or both yeah. of those things. Um, the main thing I'm getting from just like how this book is written is he thinks he's really fucking smart. Oh, he has no doubt about that. Oh, he thinks he's really fucking smart. And honestly, this is like my thing. I'm a bit of a smart person truther. I kind of don't think they're real. You don't think smart people are real? No, I think it's a lie. Ooh, okay. I want to, please, take as much time as you need to elaborate on that. Um, well, it's just as basic as that. I've met smart people. They're still kind of fucking dumb. Oh, well, yeah, everybody's dumb in their most yeah. I mean, engineers. And everybody's, yeah, everybody's like good at certain things and bad at other things. Mm -hmm. And we've arbitrarily decided that there are smart people. And, you know, like some people are smarter, mm -hmm. but nobody is like a fucking genius. Oh, yeah. No, it's I, I've always uh, prescribed myself that your intelligence or, or how you see smartness is very much a selfish thing in that it's pretty much just a cut off. Like, I don't know about you, but particularly doing comedy, you meet a lot of people going around. And the quickest thing is if you're 30 seconds into a conversation with somebody and you're like, Oh, we're on entirely different wavelengths. I never need to listen to a word you say ever again. Nice meeting you. I'll be over there. Yeah. That's you something <laughs> I consider like smart. I'm not actually measuring anything. They could be a fucking engineer. My thing of smart and dumb, if you're dumb, it just means I have no use for you. That's, you know what? That's like a more comprehensive way of defining who's smart and who's dumb than like most people have. Good. I'll get it published. Uh, uh, David Foster Wallace clearly thinks that he's smart because he knows a lot of big words, which by the way, I haven't. Not to, like, suck my own dick, but, like, I haven't needed a dictionary while reading this. Also, uh, big, big props. I can pretty much guess what drug they're talking about. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, well, again, part of this makes me wonder if this book isn't for people who are specifically like him, like, second-guessing themselves. Because, like, for me, it's like you really needed – I needed a footnote to know the scientific name of meth hydroxymethylamine i think it was like it was, yeah okay i i guess somebody needs to you know look out their parents veranda at the in-ground pool and think that about themselves and think they're really getting in touch with the world so <laughs> i don't know it's you know at the end of the day this book probably isn't for me like <laughs> right well all right here's the thing you made the comparison to the witcher the yeah. big comparison i've always made for this movie weirdly enough is napoleon dynamite okay and i like napoleon dynamite well, and you know what? That's fine that you do. But my whole thing with that is both were things that I heard about. Everybody's like, oh, this is great. You got to see it. You got to read it. It's the best thing ever. And then once I actually saw it, it's like, I don't get this. Moreover, do I not get this? I don't get what anybody else gets about this. And mm -hmm. then that's where like the spite comes from. It feels like, like, Everybody's just playing an elaborate prank on me right now. Nobody really likes this book or this movie, right? But yeah. <laughs> the movie itself was hard. It wouldn't have been as bad had I not been in high school. Because, like, imagine watching a movie you don't like and, like, ah, eh, that's fine. And then everybody in your age group speaks in quotes from that movie for, like, six months. Yeah, yeah, It's going to yeah. rub you the wrong way. No, I, I, there's definitely stuff I felt like that about, but I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I can imagine how much it sucks. Oh, actually, never mind. Twilight. Twilight. 
I am about the perfect age for Twilight. Okay. I was like 12, 13 when those books were out and popular and like the movie wasn't out yet, but everybody was super excited for it. Right. Um, like that, that is so written for your age group. Like they could have mailed it yeah. to your house. Really. Exactly. And I was, I was the exact right age for Twilight. All the girls in my school, they love Twilight. So I bought and read Twilight and I just didn't like it. And now people, since Twilight's very different than Infinite Jest, people have come around to hating Twilight. I mean, is Twilight really that different from Infinite Jest? Well, it doesn't, yeah, pretend. A- it, it doesn't pretend to be smart. Uh, Twilight, it, okay, here's something it has in common. It's also kind of racist. Okay. Yeah. I don't know enough about Twilight about that. Uh, I know, like, there's, like, rate, like all the werewolves are Hispanic in one way or another or yeah, something all like the, that. all the werewolves are Native American. Ooh. And that's treated with about as much subtlety as you can expect. That, that sounds like a justification in the 1600s of why they needed to take out the Native Americans. <laughs> well, it kind of is because Stephanie Meyer who wrote Twilight, oh, this is turning into Twilight podcast, but Stephanie Meyer who wrote Twilight was a huge Mormon. And uh, that's okay. kind of what Mormons believe. Yeah. Mormons oh, well, believe uh, some wacky, wacky stuff. <laughs> God, We're so all it, white it, in heaven, according to the Mormons. Wow. Uh, I wasn't okay, I wasn't aware my dad was more than a lot of messages time, what was that <laughs> uh, I scrolled back through a lot of messages and I found out what I originally said to Dalton about the the part with blackface okay um he asked if I got to that part and I said oh I got to it and it was racist it was hard to read it wasn't even like modern day Rachel Dolezal blackface it was like 1930s white lipstick blackface vaudeville shit god and then i called it the worst impression of aav ever typed into a 1995 ibm computer wow oh wait that's that's the modern term for the old ebonics like and it's another thing a lot of this book strikes me as very 90s and that in particular like I mean, we, you say 30s, which it would have been a little more 30s. Like, you know, feats don't fail me now. But instead, yeah. it's like, you know, war dean mama be smacking. Like, ugh, I, I, my fucking spine shriveled up just saying it out loud for a second. Yeah, I can't say it. I'm not, I'm Caucasian. I'm calling um, it right now. I'm hoping war dean comes in at the end of this book and just kills everybody. And she's the only surviving actually, character. There you go. Actually, one other racial thing. So the, the Saudi guy. Yes, um, the, the medical Sa- attache. Yes. The medical attache. So according to the book, he's half Arab, half Canadian, white. Yeah. Half Arab, half white. You know who else is half Arab, half white? Me. Whoa. And I look like this. <laughs> wow, you're a real you're a real daywalker. There you go. Somebody I really am. <laughs> um so okay. the part where he, where he's like so Arab, so different. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Wow. All right. David talk Foster about the Wallace. Section. You're what? <laughs> let's talk about the actual section of the book. We're supposed okay. To talk yeah. About. Let, let, let's just get right into this uh, from the beginning. God, there's a lot of notes I have here. Despite, I don't think a lot really happened in this. Um, first chunk, November 3rd, year of the dependent undergarment. At the Enfield Tennis Academy, we meet Jim Trosh, who has just fallen severely ill before a match. He's having feverish hallucinations. Uh, he, it's observed that the sensation of the worst nightmares are the realization that the uh, her- my note on this was pretty simple. I'm like, oh, this is actually kind of good writing because reading it also feels like I'm in a fever dream. Yes, exactly. Uh, he actually does that kind of okay. I think like in the middle of a sentence, he's talking about looking around the room with a flashlight and then it's dropped in there. Wait, floors don't have faces. And that's mm-hmm. what he envisions, a horrible toothy face emanating from the floor in his flashlight and uh just the overall terrible sensation that this is not something appearing it has been with you the entire time unseen yeah um like again this would be a good chapter if i cared about the character at all 
this is our in- introduction to yeah. the character. If I wasn't just meeting this character, if this was a story about Jim Trollsh, age 17, then mm. this would be a good chapter about him getting really sick. Yeah. You know? Um, and, yeah, a couple notes I had were, one, mentioned this before, DFW loves the technical names for medication. Yes, he does. Um... I also kind of do, but again, it's like, it's not okay when other people do it, right? Right. right. I mean, it's hey, okay we, when I say acetaminophen. Right. I mean, we, we all have our interests. Somebody knows all the technical names of all the benzodiazepams out there. Mm-hmm. I happen to know all the subgenres of the heavy metal and can pick out black metal from progressive with bluegrass inclinations we're all into weird shit i get it i don't force people to listen. well i guess we're putting it in a book isn't forcing me to listen to it yeah but uh but if it was a book about that well, you know yeah. Yeah, if, it, be, if, if you wrote a book about something it would be a decent place i guess to this is kind of about drugs but yeah, they, well there's it's building up to something about addiction from what i understand yeah um next little section as of year of the depend adult undergarment i hate saying that out loud every fucking time i can you imagine a future where corporatism so bad they literally get to sponsor the fucking years uh well can you imagine a book where you don't know in what order stuff happens that's the (laughs) best idea that's the best idea ever it's our first day of creative writing class Uh, let's submit to the new yorker god um it, okay, a lot, so it's like, this is another thing that bothers me about the book. There are funny little bits in here, and this is relevant to the, the section we're about to talk about. Uh, so in this, we're introduced to uh, James Incandenza, Hal's dad, or Hal Oren and Mario's dad. Right, known and, as himself. Yes. And he... So within this section, there are several pages of footnotes one footnote several pages yep. about the every single title and a description of every movie that james incandenza was ever involved in yep i i wrote down some of my favorites uh yeah okay and that's the thing they're kind of good oh they're, some of the ideas i would yeah. absolutely like to see um the first thing I note is uh, what we're going to find out, the, the film cartridge known as the entertainment that is rearing its head through the book. We find out that that is actually named Infinite Jest. And in the filmography, we see there are five versions of Infinite Jest, all designated Roman numeral style, one to five, I through V, just like the original Rocky movies. Thank God. I know. And uh, apparently the final one is interred with the body of James in Candenza, the, the, the master cartridge, which that's interesting. Um, let's go through here. Uh, one of his films, Fun with Teeth, 73 minutes of a dentist performing root canals without anesthesia. I'll, I'll microwave some popcorn for that. Yeah, but so these are actually kind of funny and like good, mm. but... They're hidden in the footnotes. And okay, it's just like reading Infinite Chess. Of Infinite Chess. There's some good stuff in there, but I am so pissed off that I had to turn to the back of the book to find it. And it's in this, it's in this format that I just hate. I'm going into it with a poisoned mind and I'm just hating it the whole time. If, if, uh, for instance, they had like sprinkled James Incandenza's movies throughout the book and it was like an ongoing joke that he made all these weird movies Mm -hmm. it would be so funny when you're like halfway through the book and uh somebody mentions that james and candenza made fun with tea exactly that would be fantastic it, it, it really feels like he just took a bunch of like like there's no setup like i'm just gonna give you a bunch of punch lines with a ton of context and make you read all of them at once and then we'll go back to the story which is just I don't know. Uh, yeah. One of them, Homo Duplex, a documentary interviewing 14 men named John Wayne, who were not the John Wayne. Incredible. Yeah. We actually meet a character named John Wayne coming up. Uh, the man who began to suspect he was made of glass. 
which is, as you might be able to guess, a man who is beginning to suspect he is made of glass with hilarious results. Uh, did you see any of these that jumped out to you? Uh, no, because I, so the first time I read this, when I was reading this on my original read, I read all of them and I remember thinking some of them were good. But when I reread this to do this podcast, I absolutely did not look at that section. I <laughs> Even not though they're pretty you. good. Even uh, though they're pretty good. I just hate the format so much oh, yeah. that I don't want to read it. No. Um, okay. So let me just get through two more here. Uh, the American Center as Seen Through a Brick, a documentary of the life of a brick from its creation in, for a Boston street to its final days being thrown through a window in a Quebecois riot. I, again. Okay. That's kind of good. <laughs> yeah. That's like, if that was just the plot of a music video, it would it'd probably be one of my favorite music videos because that's pretty cool. Yeah. These um, would all be good music videos, honestly. I really, I personally am of the opinion that the music video needs to get its proper day of reckoning as legitimate art. Oh, yeah. I, I've, always, I've always felt like that. And uh, the final one I have here, The Desire to Desire, a mortician falls in love with a beautiful corpse and her paralyzed sister that she died rescuing from the attack of an oversized feral infant. This is one of five or six of the movies in the filmography that involve an oversized feral infant. So that would be, uh, a, I believe that's referred to as a motif of Mr. Ah. Incandenza's directorial work. <laughs> okay, Incandenza. I mean, remember that giant baby that everybody hated on Twitter? I actually don't. <laughs> is there a giant baby that I've been missing out on? Well, there was this huge baby that people on Twitter were mad about, which is proof that this is a solid concept. David Foster Wallace, write these stories instead. Something that's clearly been hiding in like the collective subconscious that like everybody just hates a giant baby. Yeah, it's like when you see a baby that's too big, you're like, oh no. <laughs> oh no. I think it's like, it's, it's like all of our inner, uh, all of our inner pussies are just like oh somebody get somebody give birth to that <laughs> Ooh, God. even so, men to have that instinct well that's good because then it's it, it's a collection it's a collective empathy i guess yeah. for just all the all the bruised pussies in the world this bud's for yeah. you <laughs> all of the all of the ripped um the gooch all the ripped gooches ripped gooches yeah, that's gross <laughs> That'd be a great name for a book, actually. Ripped Gooches and Other Tales of the Death of the American Dream. Okay. I know. Oh, that's my mm, Stealing that. Take it. I'll forget it by the uh, time we're done. Man, I wish... I wish David Foster Wallace was uh, alive to get mad at me for critiquing him on his writing when I've been paid to write a listicle before. Oh, God. Yeah, God. You know, it's crazy to think of just... The modern, the the great writers of the last, pretty much anyone who existed before the internet and mm -hmm. how they never, what was their demeaning thing they had to do to make a check at first? And yeah. is it anywhere near a listicle? Yeah. Oh my God. That's a great concept. Hold on. <laughs> um, man, what was the listicle? I, there is like dumb shit in the past, right? Oh yeah, well, I mean, hey, people needed their obituaries written back then, so yeah, uh, yeah. You know, some people have to write up the the great benefits of this particular dishwasher over that one. I'm sure, I'm almost pretty sure Vonnegut had to do that shit at some point. So. Oh, of course, of course. The thing is, though, like all that stuff still exists in our world. Mm -hmm. uh, like we still have trashy magazines. Uh, we still have obituaries, but we also have listicles. <laughs> Yeah, it's, oh, God, do you ever, we're going on a tangent here, but yeah. do, you, are, do you ever just hate your own psychology when you realize it works? Because that's so dumb, oh, yeah. but I'm so much more likely to click on it. Same thing with the new journalism thing, where it's like, we're going to, we're going to make this something you hate, no matter what, because then if you agree, you'll click, and if you hate, you'll also click, and in between nowhere is any kind of truth. It's, yes, that's so annoying. That's so annoying. Um, it's, uh, I've been told I watch too much news. Yeah. Uh, and it's making me upset, and that's probably true. 
See, I, I, I try to cut back on my news and only keep it like just a little bit. I, I, I found like my three or four writers who really sum things up that I trust. One of them's a very conservative writer that I don't even agree with on anything, but I need to know what that side is saying and actually thinks, you know? Yeah, I do. You know what? I do that too. Like I try, like a lot of my political media, I consume from sources that are both to the left of me and to the right of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and like sources that are more mainstream and sources that are more dirty DIY vibes. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because like, it's kind of useful to get all the perspectives. Exactly. Even if it's something you 100% disagree with, like mm-hmm. these Syrian refugees, we need to put them to work at Costco's. I want to know the reasoning behind that. Right. Actually, yeah. That's, that's why I, that's why I love having arguments in bars. Oh, don't you miss it? Oh, I miss it so bad. I miss it so bad. Me, it's me like, and, I don't do that anymore. I just talk to my friends mostly. Yeah. Now, me and my girlfriend just moved. We moved into this current apartment like the weekend that quarantine was starting. We live two floors above a bar that we were so excited to go to all the time. And of course, we have not set foot once inside the place because it would kill us probably. Yeah. My neighborhood bar closed for good. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. When they were like, bars have to close. Um, or like, uh, so this was a place that also did serve food, pretty good uh-huh. food, dope nachos. I would watch the Super Bowl there every year. Hell yeah. Um, and so they could have like continued serving food to go. Um, and I think people would have got it, but uh-huh. they were like, no, we're not going to try. We're just going to close for good. And they handed out all of their food to like homeless people and just shuddered. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's a bummer. Pour, pour one out for that place. Oof. I know. Where will I go if I want to maybe run into somebody I used to date? Exactly. Nice and awkward. Um, okay, so let's get back here. So, again, we find out a little bit about Hal's parents here. Uh, by the way, that's how I'm going to do this. I'm just going to read out my notes. Interrupt me if you have anything to say in between, because this, okay. this, this is more the, the summarizing for other people who have read or maybe aren't as sharp on what's happening here. Okay. Uh, I also have a couple of notes that I would like to read as well. Absolutely. All right. We find out about Hal's parents, James and Avril, a May-December romance with him being the much older. Avril is considered the only knockout female in North American academia. I wrote that. I said, Hal's mom is the only hot girl. Just period. I haven't spent <laughs> a lot of time. Book. I haven't spent a lot of time around ad- academia. For all I know, it's, it's Butterface City. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. God. There, there definitely aren't a lot of glamorous women in academia. I'll tell you that. Yeah, as opposed to all the men who are just so, you know beautiful they've they've always they have such a great history of being portrayed fucking their students in every movie that has a professor of any kind yep and there are hot female teachers too yeah of course yeah um so uh their romance has the added technicality of her having to seen a greeting card to leave canada it's joked that the birth of their son Oren had been partly a maneuver for her citizenship that's and then, I have. Oren is an anchor baby. That's right. Oren the anchor. I like that. In the last five years of his life, James relinquished control of the Enfield Tennis Academy, sold all his possessions, and devoted himself solely to directing film cartridges, and then jumps right to the filmography. That's all I have for that. Do you have anything okay. on that? So, first of all, when they talk about the film cartridges, which is a huge part of this book, mm. I'm imagining VHS tapes. Everybody pictures something different. I'm actually picturing, like, for whatever reason, the first time I read it, I imagine, like, the old rolls of analog film, like Kodak, uh, Kodak, like the cylindrical ones. Mm -hmm. But I've heard some people say uh, VHS tapes. Yeah, it's uh, everybody pictures something different. They seem like VHS tapes to me, which makes me, like, I, I don't know how I feel about, like, it's the future, but also it's the 90s. Exactly. A couple of notes I have on this. Um, first of all, uh, an interesting thing about this chapter is we find out that the split from reality happens after the George Bush, the first George Bush administration. I might have missed that. Well, what do you mean by that? Um, 
so they're talking about time and uh before the year of the fucking dove bar uh kleenex bullshit uh uh uh, they mention presidential administrations and actual years. That's and, right. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I don't even think I picked up on that, but it, it clicked in as soon as you said it. Mm-hmm. And they mention, uh, they mention Reagan and Bush. All right. So George Bush, H.W. Bush was, that's around when the split from reality happened. Right. And I don't have anything to say about that. I just wrote it down. Leave it to Republicans to sell the sponsorship rights for time. Oh, they call uh, something that James Incantenza does pretentious. And I made the note, what the fuck does David Foster Wallace think is pretentious? I, uh, if he were still alive, I would love, I would love to pick this man's brain and yeah. know exactly what he thought. What? David Foster Wallace, I got a Ouija board. Come on the pod. There you go. That's a, ooh, Ouija and dead celebrities. There uh, are worse ideas for podcasts. I once Ouija'd Oscar Wilde for fun. Oh, wow. Which would be very dramatic if I believed in it, but I don't. I imagine he'd be very, he'd be very rude to you. Like, just, yeah. just very catty. Like, I was doing something so much better before you brought me here. Yeah. Um, and I'd be like, sorry, come hang out with me. I've had two bottles of wine. I didn't have, I didn't have the planchette, the thing that you put your hands on and move it around. So I used mm. a, a cap for one of my tubes of paint. <laughs> That's extra specific. Okay. The point is I was using like a random piece of plastic that was circular. Um, anyway, very notable. They talk about the ARPANET. The what? The ARPANET in this James and Candenza te- chapter. I miss what, what is the, the ARPANET? Okay, so I'm actually, I have this open to it right now and they uh, conveyed uh, condolences by classified ARPANET electronic mail. So the ARPANET is the pre-internet. Okay. From when it was still like a military thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So... They're, I know they're never going to go into this in more detail. No. But what's going on there? Yeah, that's a specific little detail to drop in there. You know what I actually, you have one of those weird things where you hear a word and it just doesn't mean anything. And then as soon as it clicks, you see the spelling differently. That's yes. how ARPANET just clicked in my head. I was literally imagining a net. No, no, ARPANET is the pre-internet and it's exists in this universe and they're still mm. using it in the presumably 90s hmm. huh okay. they should have the internet by the time of the trial sized dove bar well i i suppose at this point i mean it doesn't listen i i hate to drop something about david foster wallace this book definitely took a few years to write i don't think he went back and edited that much Ooh, so david you've... oh Oh my God, you know what that means? David Foster Wallace thought he was so cool for knowing about the ARPANET. At one point or another, yes, he did, because it would not be in there unless he thought it would score him a point. But <laughs> every, <Yeah>. time, <laughs> every time someone has to look up reference material, he gets a little bit stronger. Yes, here's the thing. I don't think it would be in my notes if I didn't think I could use it to score a point, but guess what? It's okay when I do it. You scored a point with me, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Katu King, Look. the unappreciated genius of her time. <laughs> um, I know. Uh, I need to redeem myself because I've written listicles for money. You never know. They might, so. they might blow up. There might be Katu King fangirls in the next generation who bug their boyfriends. You have to, re- <laughs> you have to read the five things necessary so for much. summer 2020. I love that so much. <laughs> there better be. Whew. Um Man, what else do I have to say about that chapter? Um, that's it. I, I know it's end at our point. Okay. Um, we have a little mini thing here. Actually, a humorous little point. We go to Oren, who is, again, a punter for the Phoenix Cardinals. And uh, it seems in this alternate version of the NFL, the teams have to enter the game on a zip line dressed as anthropomorphic Cardinals. Not Never a bad was. idea. Uh, Oren, 
Oren Hayes Lights says this shit wasn't in the contract he signed. While his teammates reassure him the spectacle is worse if you're an eagle, an oiler, or God forbid, a brown. Like, that's a, that's a fun little image right there. Yeah. It is fun. Um, <laughs> oh, they're furries. Ooh, that's furry what I imagine. Football. Yes, that's what I imagine them looking like. They're furries playing football. I mean, hey, the NFL is really interested in getting every viewer they could. I could see them doing a month where everybody wears foxtails. I I don't know if I like that or not. No. <laughs> Part of me is like that, like that rules, but that would make me so deeply uncomfortable. But ima- imagine, that. imagine the running back just getting by the defense, and then he has him by the tail, and he wings him around a bit. Oh, like flag football. Yeah, exactly. Kinda, only, yeah. It's a, only it's a tail coming out your butt. Yeah. Mm. Um, we have a quick dream from somebody. I think it's Hal, maybe, where he's on a giant tennis court, unable to serve. A, uh, a, a, a depressed umpire continues to whisper, please play, playing them to start. And the court is so large that his opponent is too distant to see. Again, just two brief little things here of people talking. I don't, I don't know. I don't have, you have anything about that? No, that's like a classic stress dream. Yeah. Um, all right. Now we're getting into the chapter that I really, really like. We're in, uh, Oh, the one chapter where things happen. Exactly. We're, we're introduced to a character and told about their history and have development into the way they think and feel. And I'm sure she will disappear for the rest of the fucking book. She's not coming back. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, so we have Catherine Gompert who is speaking with a doctor. She is on suicide watch and her doctor is doing his best impression of a doctor listening to a patient while she expresses her existential pain um, she's laying on her side intentionally trying to make herself hyperventilate fourth hospitalization in three years, two previous suicide attempts, one by overdose, the other one with a slit wrist. Um, doctor observes that this has not been a standard cry for help of many suicide attempts. This is a girl who wanted out and apparently half the suicide watch ward were teenagers who swallowed two bottles of my after a high school breakup and a plea for help. And this is not her. Um, yeah any any initial thoughts i still have some notes here but it's a bit and there's quotes so my my notes are pretty stupid uh i say big tits goth gf she's not like other suicidal girls (laughs) (laughs) okay even though i kind of do like this chapter um because stuff happens in it Uh right she they repeatedly talk about her big tits true and they do kind of make a point of like, she's not like the other suicide girls. Okay. I could see it. I think I almost looked at it at that. Like this first fleshed out character expressing themselves was like an oasis in this desert. So, oh, I, did, so I didn't care. The water was dirty. I just drank it down and was thankful for it. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, you're, you're right. That is very, <laughs> I don't try to kill myself like those bimbos. I'm, yeah. I'm deep. Nobody broke up with me. <laughs> Yeah, I just um, feel pain, which makes me better. Yeah. But I think that the description of like her suicidal ideation is actually really like good and poignant. Agreed. And like it it feels, dare I say, real. Mm-hmm. Um the part about weed's kind of weird though. Yeah, that yeah, it's so obviously this is important to look at because, you know, an author who would go on to kill himself, putting the words of somebody depressed and trying to kill themselves in a novel mm-hmm. says some extra things. Like I almost wonder if he wasn't trying so hard to impress everyone around him, if maybe a little bit of this pain wouldn't have gotten out more. But then as soon as we're there feeling about it, he has to get back to, into by the way, and that's why I've smoked way too much marijuana. It's not because, you know, not for the dumb reasons other people do. I have an existential yeah. dread that smothers me, and that's why. Which, like, okay. <laughs> it's, it's just, like, weirdly described. It's 
because this is an alternate universe, I'm almost like tricked myself into believing that one of the differences between the Infinite Jest universe and our universe um, is that in this one, weed is the worst drug. It does seem like they're portraying it like that. The, yeah. The, the only time they even hint that weed is regular is uh, the chapter where the guy is really agonizing over getting weed and he makes up the excuse that, oh, well, I'm actually addicted to crystal meth. That way, if she knows I'm addicted to this, then she won't have problem bringing me this ludicrous amount of weed. Mm-hmm. Other than that, weed is presented as the thing that, like, destroys people. Yeah, this book is, like, a weird mix between, like, straight-up reefer madness, weed is the worst thing to ever happen, and also, like, genuine, this reminds me of the problematic stoners I know. Right. Well, it's un- unfortunately uh, that that is the way it is with a lot of the stoners where on the one hand, you have the people who are really fucked up on it, who like, ah, it's natural. It's great. Even though like, yeah, but it's also sap your will and creativity and ambition to do anything. Anybody that's ever tried to talk to me about legalizing weed at a party. Yeah. Can fucking go to hell. <laughs> uh, it's I was talk- a horrible conversation. I was talking with a friend today who was, uh, he was a goody two shoes all through high school. And it wasn't until like his mid twenties that he really got into both atheism and marijuana. Oh God, that guy sucks. So that's the thing. So he had the vim and vigor of like a 14 year old. I'm an atheist and I smoke weed now only at 27. And it was, it was a rough year with my pal, Joey. (laughs) Yeah. You got, okay, you got to do, like, you got to go through that phase at some point, but, like, for, for the love of God, get it over with. Exactly. It's just, it's just, that's what the ninth grade is for. Oh, but that was the other thing I was going to say, that David Foster Wallace, because I know he had a marijuana problem like this, where they kind of try to portray it as evil, but it's like, oh, well, how much of it were you taking? Like, oh, mass quantities every 30 minutes. Like, yeah, if you do that with water, it'll fuck up your day. It yeah. has nothing to do with the product. I kind of, like... I mean, I I kind of, I don't want to say agree with the book, but like, uh, weed isn't inherently the worst drug, but just like fucking anything, you could fuck your life up with it. You could fuck your life up with anything, you know? Yeah. The only difference is with weed, it's the fucking up your life doesn't lead you, you know, blowing somebody for your next fix. It just leads to you being a very uninteresting, boring person. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it's so like, weed's not going to like physically kill you. You can't overdose on weed. There's really no like horrific physical side effects, but like you might suck at parties and be bad at your job. Exactly. Well, that's Um, what, that's when the real hardliners go like, well, what? what was that? If you want to be bad at your job and be annoying at parties, go ahead. Uh, well, those are the, there's a lot of those people who take it the extra step of validating themselves and say like, well, you know, in, in, under any system but capitalism, it wouldn't be a problem that I'm fucked up at work and not doing a very good job. But that's its own thing. No? <laughs> okay. No, I'm just like, but to the person that says that, I'm like, well, okay. If, <laughs> if you want to be bad at your job, Go ahead. I've had jobs that I was kind of bad at. Some jobs are just meant to be bad at. Nobody, not a lot, not a lot of burger flippers out there killing it right now. No, no. Hmm. Actually, you know what? Some line cooks are actually really good. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. Some line cooks are great. Um, I was, I worked in restaurants for years. Was I good at it? Eh, Not really. I was a, (laughs) I was a killer delivery driver at a pizza place. I was like, they should retire my fucking license plate. I was awesome at it. I yeah. still miss it a little bit, even though I'm glad to work in an office and have insurance for a change. Yeah, I was an okay server. <laughs> I was an okay server. I also worked in a luxury shoe store, and I was pretty good at that. So. There you go. There you go. Uh, l- yeah. Let me get s- some of the quotes out for this chapter. I liked uh, – Kate says, I wasn't trying to hurt myself. I was trying to kill myself. There's a difference. Again, trying to put it, um, something I've used this before. I didn't, uh, I didn't want to play anymore. That's all. Um, she describes her depression, not as a sadness, just a general ickiness over her entire being quote. It's like, I can't get enough outside it to call it anything. It's like horror more than sadness. 
Now, people who've been deep in depression could definitely relate to that, especially this line, which I really like. The doctor points out she's had fits of this feeling before and had it disappeared. She responds, but when you're in the feeling, you forget. The feeling feels like it's always been there and will always be there, and you forget it ever wasn't, which I like I like that a lot. As somebody who's had issues with depression, I'd say that's a pretty good uh, descriptor. Yeah. As a fellow, actually, me and Kate Grumper on the same, we're all, I'm also on Zoloft, but- There you go. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's right. It's like a lot of my experiences with depression have been like, I kind of, I get a little bit out of it and then I'm like, oh, holy shit. I was super depressed for like two months. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and yeah, those are all pretty accurate descriptions of depression. Yeah, just the the general, like, overall, like, nothing feels good for that entire period. Thankfully, I never had the kind, I had a very active depression. I know a lot of people have that, like, oh, I couldn't get out of bed for a week. Like, I I don't get that at all. It sounds fucking terrible. My depression mm-hmm. was always, uh, it's, I, I always equated a lot of my depression was, it was very panicky. It was like, uh. It was like the power had gone off on my refrigerator and it's, fuck, what am I going to do about all this? Because I got to do something. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, have the kind that, I have the kind that makes you lazier, but it, it's never been to the point where, like, it gets in the way of, like, my actual work or, or that kind of thing. I just, like, write less. Uh-uh. Uh, David Foster Wallace, hit me up. We can talk about this. Bring out the um, we- bring out the Ouija board. I'm sure he'll talk with you. Yeah. You you might want to have a dictionary handy, but. Uh, yeah. She, I like the point where that where she clearly does this. You know, you know my problems with depression. Where this is an audio medium. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. She, the, David Foster Wallace takes the time to physically write out the thumb and index finger smoking a joint thing. I'm, yeah. surprised, I'm surprised that wasn't a footnote right there. Popul- <laughs> yeah. Popularized Sometimes. in parking lots in the 1970s. Oh, God. Okay. Um, from there, we get into uh, a little bit of Mario in Candenza and Stitt. I didn't even write down his first name, Stitt. Stitt. Um, so, yeah, we know Mario is messed up in some way, some kind of deformity. Stitt mm-hmm. is the head coach at infield, and the only person he seems to like out of all his students is Mario, who's not really one of his students. He's just kind of a general helper. Mm-hmm. DFW has an interesting line here. He writes that the deformed and damaged are seen less than human by others, which make them make people open up to them more. You get to eavesdrop the quote, if nobody's really in there, there's nothing to hide. Okay. That's good. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's a that's a good observation on a horrible thing people do. This is what I read books for. Yeah. <laughs> Descriptions of depression. Mm-hmm. Um Okay, so this is this is something that I picked out as pretty interesting. Um mm-hmm. God, I have I have to actually find the quote. I'm sorry. That's I fine. didn't write it down. Um Okay, they talk about uh, the thing with shit, like most of your, I'm calling him shit, sorry. The thing with shit, like most Europeans of this generation anchored from infancy to certain permanent values, which yes, okay, granted, may admittedly have a whiff of proto-fascist potential about them, but which do nevertheless anchor nicely the soul and course of life. Old world patriarchal stuff like honor and discipline and fidelity to some larger unit. I thought that was shorter. (laughs) than it actually was. <laughs> no, I wouldn't a- have read the whole thing. But that, I thought, was a little interesting snippet. I like that, too. I, I, I like the little drop of a proto-fascist in there, which <laughs> does I, is something that pops up in the older generation, which does humor me a little bit, that, like, yeah, know, they, they went and fought fascism, yet it is still kind of, like, lingering in the background of their own, you yeah. know. Especially because this guy... This guy's shit is Nazi age. I'm imagining him as like a Doctor Strange love type. I was, you know what's funny? I was picturing him not as a fuck. General Turgid. What is that actor's name in Strange Love? 
I don't know. That I know the guy though. Right. I I was picturing him like that because they mentioned that he has kind of like the whitish flat top that Mm -hmm. makes old men look as youthful as possible. Mm, Yeah. As possible as they're capable of being. Yeah. Um, I gave my dad that haircut in quarantine. (laughs) There you go. Cutting dad's hair. Yeah. Um, there's some there's there's a little stuff here that I feel like gets going but doesn't really lead anywhere where Stitt is describing that the general rule of the shortest path between two points is a straight line but then deconstructs it observing that there are almost no straight lines in life without obstructions so how is that you know what's the how do you go through that do you bore through them do you avoid them um it's shown that James and Candenza personally pick this guy out to be the head coach at Enfield because he looked at tennis and not quite as much in like the physical technicality, but like the it, mathematically the like the, the opening potentials in every movement. The pure, the pure contemplation of tennis theory. Exactly. The perfect platonic ideal of tennis. Right. Which is a thing. What a loser. People. <laughs> it's a thing people think about sometimes. Um, a nice little tidbit I like here. They talk about how all tennis academies need to have a motto. Mm. And the current one is picked out by Uncle CT. The man who knows his limitations has none. Uncle CT might be the most likable character. Right. He seems, he, he, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like him. I, I'm looking forward to meeting him more. I do yeah. like the, that the original motto for the school picked by James Candenza is in Latin, uh, they can kill you, but the legalities of eating you are a bit dicier. Fun I don't with to read teeth. It. That's some fun with teeth shit. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, what a character, James and Candenza. Yeah, I know. I'm looking forward to learning more about him. I know in the next few chapters, there's actually an incident that plays out with James and Candenza's father just yelling at him for like nine pages that uh, in asking people to do this podcast, that is the only one so far where I've had somebody say, can I please do that chapter? That's great. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. Wait, one. can I ask you to name names? Who's, who did that? Uh, it, it, it's my cousin, Frank, which I know is a weird, I, oh, I'll probably, nice. I will probably credit him on the podcast. Right? I like knowing. I'll probably credit him on the podcast as my cousin, Frank, but uh, he is because so much of this podcast is my own personal problems with this kind of literature. This is the cousin who was always like a big brother to me suggesting Mm -hmm. all the books and he just happened to read it this year. So he's, he's somebody. I like that. He read it recently. Yeah. He started reading it. Well, he got furloughed from his job and his wife is a nurse. So he's just staying at home taking care of like the baby and when the baby's been asleep he's just been reading this fucking book and even he said like i'm glad i read it but it's not great Mm, so yeah i'm also (laughs) i'm glad i read it or i'm glad i read the 200 ish pages of it that i did look the first time i tried with this book i got 400 pages in before i gave up so it's still you got a lot more to go do that's what I don't like about it. It's it's like reading this book. It's like looking at a mountain that I have to climb, you know. And I'm just like, I don't fucking want. <laughs> I know I'll be a better person if I do it, but like, God, I don't fucking want to. If any, I look at it this way: I will have infinite ammo to argue with David Foster Wallace fans forever after yes, this. Yes, I do like that, I and do I'm like down that. with that because more than anything else, I enjoy arguing. Um. I, oh, and- I love arguing. Oh my okay. God. Not so, to go back to this, but like I was a passionate person who argued with people at bars before the pandemic. Oh yeah. I'm still that, that like that's honestly a big approach I have with stand up. All my favorite guys are usually the people who like present some very disagreeable notion and then give you very flawed logic of no this is why we should do this i think that is the funniest Mm -hmm. thing in the fucking world like i have a whole bit i've been working on that i was doing before quarantine i can't wait to actually perform again that's just pretty much based on like you need to sleep with people who have different political views than you which is a horrible thing for most people to imagine nowadays and then list like the good things about that. And I love that bit so fucking much. I, 
actually agree with that. Um, probably because part, part of my philosophy is, uh, I, I think communists rule. I love communists. I don't agree with them. I don't agree with their actual policies. They're However, just better people. <laughs> no, I just think that we need some pol uh, communists in America because we've been shifting too far right for too long. Oh, and yeah. we've got some pretty extreme right wing people that are, um, you know, not an insignificant group in the mm. in the right wing voting bloc. We need that on the left. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's part of the reason I was really gung ho for Bernie, even though a lot of his stuff I disagreed with. It's just the country moved so far to the right that I think we need a left wing Trump where like, yeah. we'll push the agenda way more to the left. But, you know, hopefully this time Congress will actually rein him in a little bit from the stupid shit. Right. I, I love Bernie. And I also agree with that thinking. And that is why also in college, but not at all related to Infinite Jest. I did sleep with a communist in college. Oh. Because I, because I believe I want the movement to keep going. You know what I mean? And it's gonna die if those guys can't get any. True, true. I mean, well, you, you, hey, you're you're doing good. You're you're donating to the party and keeping the movement I, uh, alive. So look, I'm I'm at the time I was a waitress. I'm just can't give financially. <laughs> to each according to his ability. Yeah. From each according to uh, their ability to each according to their needs. There you go. Um, I wonder how many people communism has gotten laid. Like, if you had to stack them up, we know capitalism gets people laid plenty. Constantly, yeah. Uh, communism, I don't know, maybe just that one? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you were the, God, you were the only person who has ever slept with a communist, and you're the first one to find out about that. How do you feel now? Um, honestly, proud. Uh, I'm kidding. I mean, I, okay, look, it's not like I slept with this guy because he was a communist. Uh, that sounds like backpedaling to me, but okay. I'm just saying, I would have. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, back to that little section, my only note I have at the end of Mario and Stitt's conversation is they go and get ice cream together. Yeah. That's it. I'm it's kind of it. nice. Um, they talk about how Mario always gets chocolate and shit gets the um, complicate like fancy flavors, and then they uh. describe him eating Neapolitan ice cream. <laughs> That's not that fancy. No, it's it's not. I haven't had Neapolitan ice cream in such a long time, and me and my girlfriend are going for ice cream as soon as I'm done this podcast. So Ooh, that sounds great. You're gonna say, well, it's don't get too excited. It's vegan ice cream. Um, oh, actually, vegan ice cream is kind of bad. <laughs> yeah. No, I listen. I'm getting my own sexual indoctrination happening over here. So yeah. Oh, that's great. That, see that people should sleep with people of vastly different beliefs than that. Exactly. It's I don't. I have Ben and Jerry's in my freezer, and now I want it. <laughs> Okay, if you're listening to this podcast right now, if you want to go ahead and grab some ice cream, uh, that's going to be the theme for the rest of this. Yeah. Go. That happens on um, my podcast. We just talk about foods we like sometimes. Yeah? Shit, okay. <laughs> sometimes. Not always, but it's it's something uh, me, me and Kevin are both big food people. Oh, wait, that's right. You have a podcast with Hufei, right? Yeah. I want to be on at some point because I haven't seen him and I miss that dude. Hell yeah. Yeah, we'll add you to the sketch. Okay, yeah. Hufei actually asked to do this podcast, but he said that I haven't read it before and I'm only going to read whatever you give me completely out of context. I That would be so good. Yeah, so you that'll, be, have him do it. That, that'll be a strange uh, offshoot episode. Okay, um, ugh, fuck. All right, let, let's just plow through what's left here. Uh, we meet a man named Tiny Yule. He is not named it ironically the way people name giant men Tiny. He actually resembles a small dwarf with gray hair and a goatee. He is detoxing and enjoying his first time out of standard issue medical facility socks called Happy Slippers, which the staff refer to as piss catchers. Um, he's driving in a car somewhere with somebody else. There's a lot of dumb, dumb detail about the air conditioner settings in the car because that is this fucking book. He's wearing a scally cap. That's all I have for that. If you have nothing to add, I will pretend that never happened. Do you have anything about Tiny Yule? No. Good. 
Fuck that. We come back to see the medical attache and his wife stuck agog looking at the entertainment. They have since been joined of the chain of command that have been sent to check on them. Uh, the medical attache, two embassy security guards, and two Seventh-day Adventist evangelical pamphleteers who had wandered into the open door to check it out. They all watched the entertainment, overwhelmed with it, covered in their own urine and feces. You got anything on that? Um, decent story about the entertainment. They could have skipped both a lot of the stuff. They could have skipped a lot of the shit in between the last time we saw um, the poop our Arab king. is the heart of the entertainment. <laughs> I don't, if you don't have feces, it doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I think they could have skipped a lot of the chapters in between the last time we saw our Arab king and then this. I think this entire book could have lost about 30% of its chapters and been fine. I mean, uh, I'm going to go with over 30%. I'm, I'm being generous because... Yeah. Let's be honest, a lot of the listeners of this podcast are people who like the book, so. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. They would have turned this one off a lot earlier than now because we really have been fucking. We go in. We've been uh, peeing off on this fucking thing. Look, okay, the, the, thing, the, the, thing the book about is the huge. It can yeah. take a punch. Sorry, what? Okay. The, the thing about the entertainment is genuinely interesting. Yes. No, yeah. I gen- I'm looking forward to see where this goes. I hope it gets a little more explanation and it's not just a MacGuffin that, you know, like they look at and then they go bad. Like I'd like a little bit of what's so entertaining about it, but maybe you know, we'll I don't it. mind. I don't mind an insane premise that I just have to buy into. They start watching the entertainment. They can't stop. Right. I'll buy into that. If that's the story. <laughs> I'll, hey, I'll, I'll take I don't it. ever need to know what the entertainment is. I didn't need to know what the, the thing in the briefcase from Pulp Fiction was. That's exactly what I was thinking, yes. But yeah, it, it's, still, it, it's still cool. It's honestly the only thing even res- resembling like a huge conflict right now. We're, you know, very deep into the first hundred pages of the book. And this is the first thing that's like, oh, this is something out there that is actively like hurting people. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Um, after this, we meet Marath and Steeply. Marath is a member of an elite group of Quebecois wheelchair assassins. That's some word salad right there, but that's fine. Uh, Steeply is undercover as a woman named Helen, although it is repeatedly pointed out how bad he is at impersonating a woman, such as uh, his hosiery falling down and uneven breasts which if this were ever made into a film adaptation, this is one of the only things I could actually picture on film. It's like, yeah. okay, that's a little this, something. This does, they are trying to make a visual gag mm-hmm. translate to literature. Mm-hmm. I don't know how well it works out. But he has the one little line here about how uh, steeply, one of the things that gives him away is just how he moves so unwomanly. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I, again, I don't have breasts, so I don't know how this is, but the line is he sticks, he, he sticks out his elbow to light a cigarette, which no woman would do because it would move her breasts uncomfortably in her clothing. Okay, so I actually did that. So when I was, when I was reading this section, um, when I was reading this section, I, I tried, was like, okay, like, is he doing that? Is he sticking out uh-huh. to the side or out in front of him? But both of which feel uncomfortable. And then I was like, okay, I'm a woman. For research, I'm going to go light a cigarette how I would naturally do it. Mm-hmm. And how I would naturally do it is the feminine way described in the book where it's like- You tuck your elbows in kind of. My elbows at my side and just my forearm comes up and does it. But like- See, I don't think you ever realized that you were doing that so your titties weren't knocking around. Thank you, David Foster Wallace, for letting women okay. everywhere know about their bodies. I have a question. Um, doesn't everybody do that? <laughs> so, you see, when, when he puts it, I'm picturing like the big video game movie, like, you know, the hero has just defeated the villain, like, you know, see you in Albuquerque or whatever the fuck. And then yeah. he goes and he lights a thing like that. And I do picture the elbows out. Okay. See, th- there is some truth to that. Like, in general, men and women do move differently. The uh, one of the most interesting things I heard was, um, "Look at your fingernails." Oh, I know. 
if you if you instruct someone to look at their fingernails, a woman is likely to do it like this with the out. the whole back of their hand uh -huh. facing them, and a man is likely to do it uh, like by yes by having the palm of their hand facing them and then turning their fingers in. All right. Similarly, like guys and girls take off t-shirts differently. There's a lot of all right, hold on, hold on. real Things quick. Like that. I, I have a funny personal story about that. Uh, when I was 15 and going through my goth years and Hell painting yeah. my nails black, uh, my stepfather was struggling with what this meant to him. And the line he drew was like, all right, listen, I can stand if you wear black nail polish. Don't put your fucking hand out there to look at it like that. Curl it in, okay? Look at your nail polish like a man, Jesse. And uh, That's such a thing. Though. I carry like, it with me to this day. And now, so I heard this before the days of emojis, but now the first thing is I think of the painting nails emoji with the woman's hand out in front of her. So that I associate, <laughs> that's what I associate that with now. Um, but there are definitely like better ways to mention that this guy is still moving in a masculine way by saying that he didn't Put his he put his elbow out, which a woman would never do because it would knock her tits around too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Hey, some people people are moved by this book. You and I are the weird ones. We don't fucking get it. For all I know, that for all I know, that made somebody go back to college to get their masters. That line right there. So hey, okay. we're the ones missing out. Ah. <laughs> uh. Dude, this pandemic might make me go back to college. Ugh, yeah, if I ever got the fucking time, I would, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so Marath. Marath is a Quebecois in the wheelchair. Steeply is the American in drag. Marath has a wife who is very ill and in need of medical services. As such, he is now a double agent to the Quebecois cause, pretending to be their agent while feeding the Americans information though he may in fact be a triple agent only pretending to be pretending to be loyal. I mean, um, there's, there's some fun wordplay in there. I feel yeah. like Monty, Monty Python did it great 20 years beforehand to pretend to pretend to pretend. You know yes. that I know that you know that I know, but. So, okay. It's benign. Besides the stuff that would read as problematic to the 2020 reader about the, the tits and the um, going like way out of the way all the time to talk about how gross Steeply looks. Mm -hmm. um, this is a decent chapter. Yeah. It's, first of all, uh, stuff happens in it and they're mm -hmm. talking about the plot of the book. I right. mean... They're talking about the entertainment, what it is, what it does. Right. We get, the, we get the revelation that the entertainment was sent to the medical attache's physician through the Quebecois rebels. They know this by uh, the address in Boston. Also, we find out that by the time that this had stopped, people kept going up to that room and getting trapped by watching the entertainment until somebody decided to cut the power, which presumably kills people once it's removed from it. They're presumed dead afterward. Mm -hmm. So, interesting. We're, we're building on the world. We're building on what's happening. Yes. Um, somebody drops in there randomly that Hal's mother, Avril, is also a Canadian spy, supposedly sleeping around, because, you know, mm -hmm. again, strong women, David Foster Wallace. Oh, yeah. Um... Yes. Uh, I, like, this is, like, one of the decent chapters. There, there's a lot of humor in it, which, right. for obvious reasons, I like. Mm -hmm. um, I personally... Um, okay, it's one of those things where, like, uh, you ever, like, watch an older... Uh, read in a book or watch a movie or TV show that's kind of older... And you're just struck with that deep, they couldn't do this today. All the time. Yeah. Um, where it's like, that's how I feel about this chapter. Hmm. But like ignoring that feeling, which by the way, I'm not like, I don't think well, it's actually problematic that Steve I, I was going to say, what, what is it? it? Is it just the fact that he's cross-dressing or the way uh, Wallace chooses to portray him? Uh, I think it's the way it's described. Right. Like, it's not the actual 
cross-dressing. Mm-hmm. Um, and honestly, even cross-dressing as a joke, I think is fine, even though that's, um, that's not something you could get away with these days, or at least right. not as much. Right. Uh, I don't mind cross-dressing as a joke. I, and I don't mind that he's ugly, um, but the way it's described is just kind of like this, so, like, this is the only real problem I have with it. The tits thing and then other parts of it, it's just described as like ooh, viscerally gross. It's not even funny. It's just like, right. <laughs> hmm. um, like they talk about how he um, presumably removed facial hair by, I don't think he shaved, but, but he's got like bad razor burn essentially on his face right okay um the way that they describe it is just gross yeah yeah just gross overall um and then we round out the chapter we get the information that uh maine and new hampshire and parts of upstate new york are now property of canada Mm -hmm. interesting world building and then just because we've had such a nice chapter let's end the world building with something about a herd of feral vicious hamsters that patrol that area which that rules. <laughs> yeah i mean hey that's that that's great i'm i'm glad to know that uh i'm glad to know that they had you know fox network animators you know with the same idea around the same time and that it worked its way into this piece of great fiction okay that's within nice. so like i've been ragging on this a lot mm-hmm. but like, one of the things that annoys me about it so much, and I think I've said this before, but, like, within this giant book, there is a good story. Somewhere. But it's, like, padded out with so much just irrelevant bullshit. I'm sorry. I don't care about the drug stuff. It's not that interesting. It's not that moving. I just, I right. just don't care. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not connected to any of the characters enough to feel bad for them or to feel like like I know it's a story about addiction but it doesn't feel like it right because the addiction like doesn't at least at the point where I am the addictions of these characters don't really have um they don't really change anything that happens in the book Right. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing really about the longing of that addiction, what they're mm-hmm. running from, the consequences of said addiction. It's just they're, mm-hmm. they're addicted so bad that... That it makes their life worse in a way that doesn't affect any of the other characters. Exactly. What, when you go to like a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, you don't get a, oh man, I was really bad there. I was so anxious about ordering that drug I was terribly yeah. addicted to. Like, oh, you brave man. Okay, here's the thing. That could be kind of realistic. You know, there are, there are I'm sure, tons. I, I mean, I've even had, uh, like, my best friend stopped drinking and uh, got sober. And she was like, oh, well, alcohol is, like, really affecting me negatively. I'm like, what? It wasn't affecting me negatively. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of cases where... Um, and she's not an AA or anything. She stopped, just stopped drinking. So there's a lot of um, instances where, yeah, your addiction really only affects you. But guess what? Mm. This is a book. Yes, exactly. <laughs> like, I want conflict. You're not, you're not talking about somebody who existed in the real world. So it's not like we have other reference or we can infer because this was a real person. We don't need that detail. Like you invented this person. You need to tell us everything about them you're yeah. doing a bad job you know functional alcoholics or even um people that are like high 24 7 but like fine mm-hmm. you know that might affect them personally like <laughs> you know maybe your friend who's a huge stoner but like generally a cool guy maybe they don't like that they've been in their house for four days you know exactly that's something that's something worth approaching and discussing but i don't know not but in like, and it's just like you have all of these snippets about addiction and then it, it's like you got to chisel the story out of all this bullshit. Right. I, I wish I could just read the story. 
you know? Exactly. And it's, well, the other thing is if that is what the story, if I, if this is the method I need to go through to get the story that I myself am doing part of chiseling the marble into the statue, it better mm. be the best fucking story I've ever heard. Also, and like, I don't want to do it. Maybe it's because I come from a background of doing comedy where uh, there's something called economy of words. Yeah. And also every article I've ever written, I went way over the word count and I had to heavily edit it. Uh-huh. Um, bitch, edit your book. Yeah. I mean, even, even looking at it at comedy and it's the same way I'm kind of looking at it like this. When somebody, have you ever seen somebody who has a good idea for a bit and you're really into the premise and there's a few lines in there, but then it's just, it's just hobbled and not paced right but then they get mad at the crowd it's like but i'm not getting the reaction you want because you haven't done the fucking work and i'm not doing it for you yeah exactly i don't want to do the work i don't know you know i'm sure i'm sure people that love the david foster wallace would be like oh listicle girl is lazy Mm. but here's the thing i don't like i i don't mind what's there i hate what i have to do to get to it Exactly. I hate what I have to do to get to it. This chapter is pretty good, actually. Right. This no, chapter is pretty good. I will say this particular reading that we've done today, the 30 or so pages, <laughs> probably has had the best actual meat of so far that I've done. Yes. And yes. I'm hoping maybe that's something that's exponential, that the longer the book goes on, the less detours will be taken for God knows what that can be spent on the actual stories and the characters. Right. Because so, it does like, seem to be ramping. The realization that these people have been staring at the entertainment for days and days and days and just shitting themselves and then they die when the power's cut off Mm -hmm. is genuinely really interesting. And when I was reading earlier sections for the first time and they kept going back to like, by the way, the medical attache is still watching the entertainment. By the way, the medical attache is still watching the entertainment. I'm like, who cares? Well, see, I actually saw that kind of cinematically, and that would be something I, I, would, I, I would like cinematically. If it's something that's being dropped and paid off later, and as these other people are going through far more interesting lives than this, if we just keep seeing, like, you know, a pan where there's, like, more and more people looking every single time. I could see that working in, like, a yeah. background of a movie. There are some, like, cinematic qualities to this Mm -hmm. this chapter in particular has some cinematic qualities which is um it's which is a good thing and a bad thing like the bad thing is that they go into a lot of detail in describing what is essentially a visual joke and it doesn't really work right or it kind of works It, it it doesn't work but it also doesn't not work it's weird um but also you know but I, I don't want to say it would be better as a movie because I still have like 800 pages to read. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see how that works. I'm sure some super fan will try to make something from it work one of these days. Yeah. But right. like David Foster Wallace, you're allowed to write multiple books. You could write the story about the entertainment and then your next story can be short stories about different people suffering from addiction. Oh, if he had just done that and just had a book about the entertainment that's just 300 pages long, I'd fucking love it. I'd be all in. That's the book I want to read. And that's what I'm talking about is like chiseling it out of the marble. Like Mm -hmm. this chapter mixed with the medical attache chapters, talk about James and Candenza, slip in the titles of the other movies he's made throughout the book as a joke that's good it's entertaining it's funny what's that to love i think maybe we should try doing a re-edit of this book get it down to a tight 250 pages and it can be re-released as infinite jest for the non-smart boys in the world (laughs) infinite jest for dummies infinite jest for dummies yes and it'll be the most uh, enjoyable book. It'll be such an enjoyable book. Your mom can read it on the beach. There you go. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think the reason this is not that is because David Foster Wallace is too far up his own ass to write a beach book. But this could have been a good beach book. It, it, it definitely could have. And I mean, uh, I talked about this with Dan Ostrov, where he, David Foster Wallace always said how he was like second guessing himself mm-hmm. constantly. 
And this seems to be like the book version of that. It goes to show that in his life, he only fully completed two novels with a third one done posthumously. So I can buy that, that like he just second guessed himself so much that the only novel that he was able to really get out and have it be something is completely unedited, gigantic, swollen tick of a book. Because, here's the it's thing. Just, because he couldn't pare it down. Because his brain I believe it. that, but I don't admire that. That's it, a yes. flaw. <laughs> that is one of the things I don't fucking get is other authors like Kurt Vonnegut. Like, guy no, I love a, Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> guy is a war veteran, and he, despite being an older man, adopted this hippie live and let live mindset mm-hmm. and wanted to tell people the world is beautiful and don't worry about if anything happens after it. That's somebody I aspire to. Who the fuck wants to be like David Foster Wallace? No one. <laughs> well, that's not what a lot of them say. A lot of them refer to him as this massive genius, and I don't, I don't see him saying anything that hasn't been said better 40 fucking years before by people who were able to tamp down their minds long enough to write more than three fucking books. Yeah. Here's the thing, though. Vonnegut books, which I, I love Vonnegut books. Love it. Uh, they're very smart. They're very intelligent books, but they're all pretty short. Yeah. Yeah. They also, they also know how to break the mold. Fucking uh, Time Quake, his last novel, which I still love. Like, he literally will break away from chunks of the book to talk about. So I originally had a different version of this book in mind that I couldn't make work. So this is what would have happened here. Anyway, back to the plot. And it's yeah. fucking enthralling. Yeah, or like um, Cat's Cradle. Favorite. where. Yes, it's so good, and kind of like this, it takes you a while, and, and the actual plot of the book is given to you in bits and pieces, and there's a ton of different characters, mm. but it's edited, it's concise, it's engaging, and it works. So this is actually coming up, uh, I'm going to be doing an episode of the Nerds with Words podcast. Mm-hmm. Adam Nutter, one of the hosts of that, is a huge fan of comic books, love, uh, loves comic books, mm-hmm. hates real books. I hate comic books, love real books. So the challenge is he is going to give me a comic book series to read, and I am going to make him read Cat's Cradle by Kurt Vonnegut. Ah, and then we're going to do <laughs> Yeah. So we're going to do an episode and yell at each other after. I figure there's enough sci-fi elements in that. I know Slaughterhouse Five is like the flasher, but like the whole mm-hmm. concept of Ice Nine and everything that happens yeah. is so interesting. I don't know why they haven't made a movie out of that one, honestly. It's definitely silly. And like the thing about feet. Oh, and the whole Bokanid, the uh, Bokanidism, yeah. the, the idea of a religion that the first word on the first page is, this is all bullshit. Anyway, in the beginning. like Yeah. Um, and yeah, finding out about more about the religion is always engaging. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Cat's Cradle is great. All right. So uh, we're going to wrap that up. This has been the Cat's Cradle is Awesome podcast. <laughs> Again, you should all go out and read Cat's Cradle. Yeah, um, don't read Infinite Jest. <laughs> <laughs> read Cat's Cradle. Cat too. This has been a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed this. Oh, I honestly, this has been so much fun. My right. computer's on 18% and I'm getting really nervous about that. That's okay. We're going to wrap it up now. Just give us all your plugs. Where can we okay, find you when um, the world is back to normal? Uh, at Simply Katu on Twitter, at Queen Katu on Instagram. My podcast is called Lil Saint Podcast Island. It's a podcast about nothing uh, that I host with my friend Kevin Hoofy, who's so funny and you'll all love him. That's it. <laughs> there you go. Check it out. Lil, Lil Saint Island Podcast. Catch Lil Saint King. Podcast Island. <laughs> Lil Saint Podcast Island. If yeah. you put all the words in there, it'll come up. It, yes, that's true. Yeah. That's true. But thank um, you for doing this. Thank you for reading this book. Um, since yeah. you're still reading it, I'll probably have you back on at some point because we'll we'll be reading it concurrently. I would love to be on again. <laughs> nice. All right. All right. So with All that, right, thank you. Yeah, thank Ending you. Meeting now. I am going to stop recording, and we can talk for a few more seconds.